My name is Carla Pareja, and I'm the Vice Chair of the International Committee of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, along with my colleague, Alessandra Tarisi. And I just wanted to say a few words about our committee be before this wonderful panel starts. We are a committee comprised of many lawyers with many different backgrounds who share a passion for international law. And we are a very interactive committee that has many opportunities for participation for our members and things like organizing panels like this one or publishing articles in our magazine, the Global Fashion Lawyer Magazine, which is published twice a year. Um, and we have also organized many fun networking events, which obviously it's, this is on standby now due to COVID, but hopefully we can resume them shortly. Uh, and I wanted to encourage you all to join our committee. If you're not a part of it yet, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun meeting our members and participating in the various initiatives that we have in place. And now I'll pass the mic to Lilibet, who is the moderator of this panel, and hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lilibet. I am a recent graduate from Pepperdine Law, and I'm currently studying for the bar, so hopefully joining all of you very soon. Um, I'm so excited to be moderating. Uh, I'd like to start off by just mentioning that the MCLE certificates will be emailed within 24 hours and the program materials for the next hour were emailed to all of you an hour ago. Um, so it should be in your emails and the, a link will be posted in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our lovely panelists. First, we have Dora Varela. Um, she is a professional skateboarder. She started to skate at the age of 10 and has not stopped since. Um, she's dedicated to training, fitness, competitions, and skateboarding with friends. In January 2019, at the age of 17, 17, she became a professional skater by the Brazilian Skate Confederation, and in June, a professional in the USA with the launch of its pro model of shape by the brand Hosoi Skateboards. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, she's currently sixth in the World Skate Olympic ranking and the first Brazilian in the Olympic race. Um, I'm so excited to have her. It's really exciting to always have an athlete join us. Um, I have her, we'll have a little, little question and answer for her later so you can find out more. Um, our next panelist is Natalia Aronovich. She is the founder of Aronovich Law Firm, a law firm in Los Angeles that helps foreigners and immigrants succeed in the United States. She is licensed to practice law in Brazil and California including business law, intellectual property, and immigration. She has several years of experience as a litigator and a transactional attorney. Ms. Aronovich's ability as a lawyer was recognized in the United States when she received her extraordinary ability visa and green card for the work she did in Brazil by helping change the law in Brazil regarding conflicts between trademarks and domain names. And in the United States, she received an award from the Board of Governors of the Beverly Hills Bar Association in September 2019 for the work done for the organization. It's remarkable. Amazing. And then our next panelist is Alexandra. Alexandra Costa is a Brazilian attorney at law for Tassara Rodriguez and Alves Costa Avogados and foreign legal consultant for Santos Lloyd Law in California. Currently, he holds the role of legal director at the Brazilian Confederation of Skateboard. CBSK and is the chairman of the Sports Commission for Brazil California Chamber of Con Con Commerce. Oof. Uh, Mr. Costa has articles published in scientific law journals like Revistas dos Tribunais, I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, um, 
the Beverly, in uh, the Beverly Hills Bar Association Journal and Globe and Fashion Lawyer Magazine. He's also the author of the book, The Moral Harassment in the Labor Relations and the Criminal Effects in Portuguese by Amazon. Alexander has been a skateboarder since 1981. And for this reason, the sport is an important part of his life. Um, so clearly we have a very Brazilian panelists board, Bienvenidos. I don't think I pronounced that right either, Bienvenidos. Um, and without further ado, we'll start with Dora for uh, questions. So welcome, thank you for joining us all the way from Sao Paulo. Thank you for having me. So exciting. Um, so can you start by sharing your background with professional skateboarding, how you got started, I started when I was 10 years old. I always had, I always do sports when I was a kid. So I did all the type of sports, but when I started skateboarding, my family, they don't skateboard at all. So it was my cousin kind of skateboards and I used to play at his house. So I like it. And my dad had the idea to go to a skate park and when I was 10 and I went there and it was like Disneyland. It was like paradise for me. So I, I had so much fun that day. I wanted to go every day to the skate park and I started learning new tricks, getting better and I never stopped it. <laughs> so exciting. Um, I mean, had, did you like see um, skateboarding becoming an Olympic sport? Did you think about it before, like as you were training and growing up? I never thought about it when I started skating, but when it when this when skateboarding became a Olympic sport, it was like a dream coming true. Cause I always watch at Olympics when I was a kid, so I was like, oh, I have the chance to go to the Olympics. I'm gonna do my best. So I started working harder to get better, go to the World Championships, and I finished school in 2019, so I could get more focused on skateboarding in 2020 and get more focused to the Olympics. So I start training every morning, skating every afternoon. And then the Olympics got delayed, but I still working on it. And hopefully we can get to go there this year. But it's great for skateboarding community, for the skateboarding scene to be in the Olympics because we're going to have more investments, more skate parks, more people joining us, skating, more brands looking for skateboarders. So it's going to be awesome for the skateboard community. Yeah, that's amazing. When did you um, decide that you wanted to take on skateboarding professionally? Like when you were like younger or when you finished school? I mean, I when I started skating, I was just like having fun every day, making new friends, trying new tricks. And it's basically all I do for the past nine years. <laughs> but everything <laughs> happened naturally. I started competing and I love to compete. So it makes me get better. It makes me want to get better every day. So it all, all happened naturally. And I still have a lot of fun. It doesn't change. So... When I became a professional, I was like, okay, I can work doing what I love. What is better than this? Yeah. What are, what are some challenges uh, professional athletes are facing now with COVID? I know that you said you continue your training, but did it affect it at all? Or is it, does it really change if, I mean, skateboarding doesn't really have like close contact um, with other people? I mean, yeah, it did. In the first like six months of quarantine, I stayed at my home and I didn't live for nothing. All the skate parks were closed and I I had to like train at home the way that I could. I bought like a mini ramp and I put on my, like my garage. It's not the same thing, but I no. was something to do. I did it the way I could, but after six months of quarantine, I started to go to some private places where my friends had skate parks and I skated the way that I could, but now I'm skating every day. Everything is open, but we still have to take care because the COVID is still here. Yeah. Does it um, change if like you don't have any like participants in the skate parks? 
because I've seen your competitions and I've seen the crowds and the waves. <laughs> Does it, do you think it would like change the, like an athlete's performance if there's no crowd or? I mean, we had a competition here in Brazil, a national competition mm -hmm. here in January, like one week or two weeks ago. And there was no crowd, it was only the athletes and the people who were involved on doing the contest. So we all get tested for COVID and there was no crowd. It was kind of weird, but yeah. when I'm skating, when I'm focused, I can't even listen to anything. So it kind of doesn't change because I don't really pay attention to this when I'm skating, but I really did miss the crowd screaming after you make the full the full run oh i'm sure i can't imagine <laughs> wow well are you worried um if the olympics don't happen this year if it gets pushed again yeah i'm kind of worried because you know i got delayed one year i i get one year more to practice and get better to go to the olympics and be at my best moment there but hopefully it will happen Sorry. Hopefully it will happen. I'm not sure yet. Nobody's sure. But I'm working hard. I'm getting ready to be there if it happens. I'm ready for anything that happens. But if it doesn't, it's okay. I'm going to still skate and having fun and be ready for the Paris 2024. <laughs> um, what, uh, what are your plans for afterwards once you do participate? after the olympics mm -hmm. I and mean, what I happens wonder, after you participate in the biggest event in the world as a professional athlete then what do you do what happens after that's the big question <laughs> yeah i'm i'm not sure what will happen with my life after that it depends on how i do in the olympics but i want to uh, travel to some places i didn't get to know yet I want to start my college because I didn't get to. I finished school in 2019 and I just focus on skateboarding. So I want to do a college mm -hmm. in 2022. I want to do business school and or marketing and probably do it in California where I can skate more. The skate parks are better and I can get maybe a scholarship or something. So Hopefully I can get to do a college in California the next yeah, year. Come to LA, come. Yeah, hopefully. It's sunny and apparently less rainy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how, Ali, how long do you train every day? What's your training schedule like? I train like at the gym one hour in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I skate for like four hours a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amazing. It's a lot, but we don't see the time. Yeah. Passing. We're just skating. We're like, oh, my God, it's four <laughs> hours. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. Um, great. Um, those are my questions for you. Um, we're going to take some Thank more you. questions from the audience again at the end. Thank you so much for All being right. here. I'm going to crash Thank your you. Olympics um debut so we're gonna make that happen i've already planned it out i'm gonna show up to tokyo it's okay mm -hmm. um okay great so our next panelist is natalia um natalia my question for you um that you so lovely prepared for all of us is um now that we've talked to an athlete uh soon to be olympian um, what are the visa options for athletes? Um, LA, it, it, we're going to have the Olympics in 2028, so it's good to start um, thinking about immigration. Um, so I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation with all of you. So give me here a second. So, oops. Started from the end. Okay, so my name is Natalia Ramovic. I'm a lawyer, as Lilibet said, in Brazil and here in California, and I'm an immigrant myself. So I do a lot of uh, business and intellectual property, but my clients are foreign. They want to come here. They want to stay here. They need to set up a business or they... Uh, so that's why I, I ended doing immigration. And as I said, I am an immigrant myself and I have to go through all this. So today we're gonna talk about no immigrant visas. 
a classification for athletes. We have mainly three types of visa for athletes. That's the B1, B1, the P1A, and the O1A. They are no immigrant visa classifications. So what's the difference between immigrant and no immigrant? First of all, uh, immigrant, we are talking about the green card. We are talking about being a resident in the United States. And no immigrant, it's like more temporary status. You come here to the United States for a limited period of time. Also, uh, in, in all the non-immigrant visas, sponsorship is required. And since we are talking about here, skateboard is not, I don't mean having a sponsor, a brand who sponsors you, but I mean someone who employs you in the United States and is responsible for you here. So uh, we are not going to talk about green cards or the immigrant visas. We are going to talk about no immigrant visas. The first one and the simplest one is the B-1 visa classification. So the B-1 visa is a temporary business visitor. They, uh, the B-1 is very famous. This could be B-1. They call B-1, B-2. The B-2, if you come here just to visit the United States. But the B-1 is if you come here on the business. And business being com compete could be competing as well as an athlete here in the United States. And the main thing is that here, you must have a home in a foreign country that the athlete does not intend to abandon. So you're not going to come here to be a resident here. Okay, that's my home in the United States. No, you're going to go back home. You're going to come here. You're going to compete. And then you're going to go back home. Uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 um, the period of the visa is for a short duration. Uh, you come to the United States. The athlete is going to come to the United States. Seek admission solely to engage in a legitimate athletic activity. Could be to come here and compete could be a, a championship or anything like this. But the, that's the, the key thing about the B-1 visa is that you cannot receive any remuneration for what you are going to come here. So if you're going to compete here and receive money for it, you can come under a B-1 visa. You can win prizes. You can uh, even like sometimes a price in money, but not be uh, remunerated for paid for your service here in the United States or for your activities as an athlete. The period of stay for a B-1 visa is short, six months, maximum to six months. And the application plot process is very easy. You go, if you are in, uh, you, you are in your country, the athlete is in his own country, he's gonna apply to a US embassy or consulate. And uh, he can come here, uh, schedule an interview and then come and get the visa and then come here. Uh, also, if you are here, let's say, under a, a visitor's visa and there is a competition that the athlete want to participate, they, they, the athlete could change their status here in the United States. But the most common is applying abroad. The second visa that's the most famous visa for athletes is called the P-1 visa. The P-1A visa is granted to an athlete or a team who is a person who performs as an athlete individually or as a part of a group or team who is internationally recognized. That's very important. So the athlete could be, the P1 visa could be for a team who's as a team or, or, as the, or the athlete as an individual and needs to be internationally recognized, the athlete or the team. But what does that mean? What does international recognition mean? So that means a high level of achievement as evidenced by a degree of skill and recognition substantially above that ordinary encounter. To the extent such achievement is renowned, leading or well-known in more than one country. So first, you cannot be an average athlete. You need to be a very good one and you need to be recognized internationally, not just your own country. So more than one country. Uh, what was the qualifying criteria? Again, the athlete or foreign team must be coming to the U.S. to perform the activities related to athletes or team abilities for which they are internationally recognized for. So let's say if you were a skateboarder, you need to come to the United States to continue practicing and competing on skateboarding championships. You cannot, if you are a skateboarder, you cannot come here and compete in a volleyball and be a volleyball player. So you have to continue what you are doing, what, what you recognize it for. 
uh, and you can you must come here to the US and the P1 visa to compete. Okay, and it's important because the P1 does not allow you to come here to train. You can you have to come here and compete. Uh, but how do you measure uh, being internationally recognized? That's not something for me as an attorney to say, okay, you are internationally recognized or for the athletes say, the immigration is gonna tell me and they have a criteria they thought that they follow and is established in the law. There is some documents I need to attach to my application. Those documents are written contracts with the uh, sponsor petitioner here in the West, because as I mentioned, you need someone who, who employs you. Uh, you need to explain the nature of the events that you are going to come here to the United States to, to, to do. So the activities, what kind of championships uh, you are going to participate, where are they, which days are. So you need to come with a schedule of everything that you are going to do here. And also you need a written, uh, written consultation from a labor organization. So adv advisory opinion. You need someone that attests that you are an athlete who is internationally recognized here in the United States. Let's say uh, the skateboarder, probably there is a skateboard confederation here in the United States. So you need to submit all these materials that you have uh, regarding your history as an athlete to them. And they are going to tell you, okay, you are, you are internationally recognized. So you can attach to the application affidavits, contracts, awards, or similar documentation that reflects the nature of your achievement as an athlete. Uh, and affidavits written by present or former employers or recognized exper experts certifying the recognition and international recognizing reputation. Let's say if you were a skateboarder, you need another skateboarder who are at the same level as you are or above to give you to tell you, oh, she's like talking about Dora, she's the best skateboarder. She's one of the best. She have everybody here knows what she's doing. She's very well recognized. So you cannot get uh, opinions from someone that is lower level than you are. Uh, and here is a list of documents that you can attach. So mostly what you need to prove is that you are internationally recognized at it. If there are ranking system for the sports that you practice, so that you're gonna show to the rank and a lot of other documents that can uh, show you this. Uh, the period of stay for a P1 visa is for an individual athlete is one to five years. And I, I can extend that for four, five more years. Uh, the application process is done uh, separately. You can apply, first you apply here in the United States, they sponsor, the employer, the agent, the manager, whoever is employing the athlete is going to file a petition called I-129. So they're going to attach all the documents saying that uh, that that is internationally recognized. They're gonna explain everything to the immigration. And if the visa is granted, then if the athlete is in his home country, he's gonna schedule an interview at the consulate or the US embassy and go to the interview and then get the visa stamped and then come to the United States. They also, if the athlete is here, the, it's possible maybe to change the status if the athlete is here competing, let's say under a B1 visa, and he wanna stay more time, there's possible to change, uh, do the entire application here in the United States. And the last one and my favorite one, and the one I know the most because that's the one I came here to the United States. And I love this visa because I, I, I have a background marketing and it's about branding, it talks about branding and help the people feel good about themselves when they get this visa and you're gonna see why. So the O-1 visa is called extraordinary ability. It's reserved for individuals who possess extraordinary abilities in the science, arts, education, business, athletes, or the entertainment industry. So we have two types of visa, the one for uh, that is for science, arts, education, business, athletics, and the other one for entertainment, for people who are in the entertainment industry. Uh, extraordinary ability means a level of expertise such that the person is one of the small percentage of the people who have risen to the very top of the field of endeavor in the sports field. So what does that mean? You need to be one in the top. Like Dora is the best one <laughs> in Brazil. <laughs> 
So she's going to be able to prove that she's a small percentage of skateboarders in Brazil who achieve it, what she achieved. It It doesn't need to be internationally. The, The standard here is a little bit more difficult to achieve, but from one aspect could be easier because you don't need to prove international recognition. You just need to prove that you were the best in your home country. And uh, also you need to be able to demonstrate that you sustain national or international acclaim. So what does that mean? That means that like if you won a competition in 1990 and you never won anything else and today you wanna come to the United States and apply for the visa, sports visa, you are not gonna be able to because from 1990 until today you did nothing. So you need to be winning, you need to be competing, you need to be keep doing things to show that you sustain uh, your national or international acclaim. Uh, the qualifying criteria, uh, first there is, if you, let's say, if you want a gold medal uh, on Olympics, a silver or a bronze, you might be able to qualify just with the medal. And, um, But if you don't have a, like a, a matter in the Olympic games, so you can use three of the qualifying criteria that the immigration give to us and from the eight, from a series of eight. So it could be any of those three that I'm going to talk about. The first, you receive a uh, national or international recognized prizes or awards for excellence in the sports field. So it could be any competition, especially for the area of skateboard, let's say, because that's what we are talking here about. Um, also, if you are a member in associations that require uh, outstanding achievement, achievements as judged by recognizing national or international experts in the field. That doesn't mean like being a member of the Confederation of Skateboarders and pay the fee. So you are not, you need to achieve something. You need to like, let's say, in order to be part of this association, you have to one, had won X amount of prizes or uh, awards or something, it's achievements, it's not not paying for the membership. I also publish materials in professional or major trade publications, newspapers, or other major media about the athlete and the athlete's performance. So all the uh, news that you've been on, magazines related to the, the area that you were practicing. Another criteria is the athlete's original scientific, scholarly, or business-related contributions of major sig- significance in the field. For an athlete, that could be okay. Let's say Dara created this new technique about practicing skateboarding. Everybody follows her because she's that's something new in the industry. Nobody was talking about before she started. And a lot of people start doing this. That's something that people follow. So that could be... Uh, an example for an athlete. Athletes' authorship or scholarly articles in professional journals or other major media in the field for which the classification is sought. And uh, let's say uh, this could be a little harder for, for uh, uh, athletes, but if she published something in the about this technique that she created, she come up with a, a, a book or something related to that, that counts. A high salary or other remuneration for service as evidenced by contracts or other reliable evidence. Let's say you were the top skateboarder who received with best pay in your country. That can be proven and that's another criteria. Also, athletes' participation on a panel or individual as a judge of work of another's in the same or in a field of specialization allied to that field for each classification is sought. So if you are judging a, a skateboard competitions and you are judging other skateboarders, that could count. And finally, athletes in point, employment in a critical or essential capacity for organization and established that have a distinguished reputation. Let's say uh, that means you are sponsored by brands who are well-known, Nike, I, I'm not sure exactly the brands in this, the skateboard, but Vans, that's one that comes. Yeah. So let's say those are the best, the brands, they're very well known and they sponsor you. That's another criteria. And you can attach any other evidence that might be relevant for, to prove your extraordinary ability. The period of stay, uh, you can come here on all one visa and stay for three years and you can get an extension. If you are with the same employer, agent and manager could be for more one year 
or if you change sponsors, that could be for three more years. The application process is very similar than the application for the P1A visa. You apply here in the United States. Your sponsor is going to file up I-129 and gather all the documents showing your, your, you are extraordinary and have that ability. And if you are in a home country, you're going to schedule the interview in your home country and then come here with the visa. And uh, also, if you are here competing, let's say on the B1 visa, you can change your status here in the United States as well. So just, just to wrap up and just a reminder, we spoke about three types of visa. B1 visa, that's the easiest and the simple one. You come here to compete, but you cannot receive any money for it. You cannot be paid, you cannot be compensated for what you're doing. The P1A, if you're international, have international recognitions in the sports field, and the O1 visa, which is extraordinary ability. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna be open to questions in that. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple questions. And if anyone has any questions for our panelists, feel free to write them in the chat and the Q&A, and we can read them off at the end. Um, Natalia, so when do athletes start this process? How long does it take? It depends the type of the visa that you are going to apply for. If a B1 visa, that you go to your, it's, it's the availability in the consulate. Uh, they have to schedule an interview. So you go to their website and see how long it takes to schedule the interview. And after the interview, if you are approved, it takes like one, two weeks for them to return the passport and give every the documents to you. The P1A and the um, O1 visa can take to three to six months. So, uh, but if you can, you can pay a, what we call a premium processing fee and that uh, it's uh, $1,225 and they decide in 15 days. But it can re they can request more evidence. So we count like one, two months, if you, even if you pay premium processing fee. And after the, the visa is approved, you still have to do the interview in your home country. So probably if you want to come here to stay here, work here, you need to during the, let's say the Olympics, the LA Olympics, you have to start planning that like one month, one year before. Okay. And then what happens? I mean, God forbid there's another COVID, but for all the people who like you apply for the visa and then you get it for that time frame, but then it needs to be extended. Is that like a simple, can you request like an extension or like how, how would that work? Yeah. As if you are here in the United States. Or like, for example, if you're Dora and you're applying for a competition that's in summer and you got it approved and you have up to six months, correct? What happens like if the competition gets pushed off another year? Can you and you got approved for a visa? Can you extend it or is, is there a process for that? Yeah, normally when you think that's if you come on like a B1 visa. Mm -hmm. Let's say that would be the simplest, as easy one. They probably uh, give it, grant you the visa for longer. Let's say sometimes in Brazil, if you go in Brazil, they give you the visa for 10 years or five years. Okay. So, so yeah, you don't, don't need to extend years. that. Yes. Okay. So it's like as soon as you get here, then you have up to the six. Okay. Yes. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. And then when you, I mean, these are personal questions, but when you apply for the visas, you only select one, like out of all the ones that you mentioned, like you have to pick one route. You can't like select all of them and see which one sticks basically. Like I'm not really familiar with immigration. So yeah, no, you, you, you can try to apply for more than one. Okay. And let's say if you, you can try to apply for P1 and uh, O1 visa at okay. the same time to see which one is. Yeah. Okay. So you, okay. yeah, we've draw, you've draw from one and the other one is. Okay. Awesome. Upper. Thank you. You're welcome. And if anyone else has questions, feel free to write it in the chat um, and we'll read it off at the end. But not political questions. Just no <laughs> political questions. <laughs> no political. Um, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, so great. We're going to move on to Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra, uh, my question for you is, what are some legal challenges the Olympics is facing right now? I mean, we're familiar with COVID and force majeures and like contractual challenges that are happening. But from your perspective, I also like you to touch upon um, uh, your work with uh, the Skate Confederation and getting um, skateboarding onto the Olympics. So if you could touch upon that also, but the legal challenges the Olympics are facing right now. 
Okay, first of all, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here amongst so amazing persons like uh, Dora, Lilibet, Carla, and also Natalia, people that I really admire as a, not only as a person, but also as a professional. I can say that I know Dora since she was a kid, and now I I'm admire her as also as a professional skater too. By the way, she won this contest that she just said that has, we, we, we held uh, like uh, two weeks ago in Brazil, she won this contest too. So she she's the current Ooh. <laughs> she's carried like the the best one there in brazil again and yeah yeah you know uh we are facing some issues there in brazil and of course in the whole in the whole world but brazil tried to make in a bubble to make some contests we had a, a one in a december on the street skater in a street park in a, in sao paulo and we made a kind of a bubble too so we only allowed to to be inside the competition who was tested for COVID-19. And of course, like uh, uh, we had some, some, some skaters that was uh, contaminated. They were like, uh, okay, you cannot come to the competition, but only uh, the organization, only the staff and the competitors were allowed to be inside the competition. We did the same in the South of Brazil now for the skate park and also the street and in the, the state of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And it was an amazing competition. And beside the fact that we didn't have the, the, the audience to, to cheer for Dora or for all the, the, the skaters in the, the competition, we had a, like, a, you know, it was a streamer to the, uh, the, the most important TV show in Brazil. So all of them were in the TV. We have the, like a, the streaming on the, the internet. So we are, we are having this, we have to adapt to this, to this situation uh, we are not uh, believing that the Olympic Games can be di so different of that, because we are not. We are moving on, moving on. But it seems like uh, every every month that we are going forward, we see that we have a new uh, variant for the the virus in, in countries like uh, South Africa, now Brazil, also uh, England. So we are trying to like uh, to handle this situation. But I believe that uh, the, the Japanese are, you know. <laughs> Japanese are wearing masks for years before the, the COVID. So they are probably taking care of everything there and they are like a double checking to avoid the, the contamination, the spread of the, the virus in the, in, during the Olympics. I already heard, by the way, a little bit, it's important that some, uh, you know, some gossip is uh, behind the scenes. <laughs> Uh, love gossip, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that we already heard that like, uh, so, uh, they are trying to get all the athletes, all the, the ones that are already allowed to be in the, the Olympics to get vaccinated before the competition. Okay. So even if you do not like uh, reach the, the criteria to be vaccinated, I believe that if you are going to the Olympics, probably you got it like a, your shot before you go there. So of course, uh, if you are talking about Olympics, we are talking about a pandemic, we have to think that we also have in a village. And so, uh, Dora will not allow there to compete like a shalom. She she arrived in uh, Tokyo today and competing the next day. No, she she must like a uh, skate in the skate park. They have to to know the 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 transitions. So of course that uh, they will have like a some like like a v very very severe to check the the athletes to avoid any kind of uh, contamination. So probably we will not have in a the big opening ceremony uh, because of course it's. It could be like a, mm -hmm. a spready party for the, the COVID, not a, a celebration to start the, the Olympics, but also like, you know, uh, during the competitions you compete and right after your competition, you, are, you need to leave the, the, the park. So not even the, the podiums will happen during the co competition. You receive, like so many other competitions, you receive your medal at like a, in your house, in your hotel, in your airplane, I don't care. What really matters is that we have the, the competition. So we are like a rooting and trying like a, and believing that Japan will make something really special to hold this uh, event. But uh, I think that I have to, when I talk about the leaps and also the issues about the athletes, we also have to talk about some like a stuff in contracts that is something that I, I told you that I was really excited to share with the, the, with the Beverly Hills Bar Association is that uh, you know, first of all, uh, we need to understand that we have some rules for uh, Olympic athletes that mm -hmm. it is, uh, it's not for the, the regular athletes or even for the, the regular professionals of the, on the sports. And so first we have to understand we have the, the rule 40 
from the, right. you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, it, no. I wrote an article with Lily Bag, but it was about the, the, the rule 50, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And the rule 40 is something like, you know, to, it's a blended about the, the culture, about the, the education and all the, the international cooperation, all the things that they don't want to see inside the, the Olympics because the Olympics are really expensive. So when you are talking about the contracts of the athletes, we don't want to see an athlete cheating uh, the rules of a marketing. Of course, you don't want to see your athletes do, going this way because it's like, you know, maybe bad for your, like your national team or something like that. And so uh, every time we talk about like a, this kind of things about the rule, we have to talk about like a, some issues that we have to avoid. One, the first one is the most important in my opinion was the ambush marketing. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, it's really important to say. And uh, once we have uh, first, when we are talking about skateboarders and also surfers, we are talking about new sports that they are normally, you know, uh, they stayed on the underground of sports for years. Mm -hmm. And now they are in the mainstream of the sports because not because they need to be in the Olympics, but probably because Olympia needs to have some, uh, this kind of a sports in the, the mainstream. So uh, we have a lot of audience for skate, surf, and all the, the new sports, and they bring the skateboards to, to the Olympics. So when you're talking about the skaters, we are talking about some like a different sponsors. We are talking about some like a, a specific sponsors for skateboarder brands and also for uh, for gears or whatever they have to use. So for example, the ambush market that we try to avoid here in US, we have two acts that protect this kind of uh, situation. First one is the Lanham Act mm -hmm. and also the, the Ted Stevens Act is for the amateur sports. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, all the Olympic symbols, all the Olympic emblems and all the Olympic issues like uh, the mascots and, not, and everything, is protected by the Olympia. They have, a, now I'm going to the, to the area of uh, Natalia, but they have intellectual property about these things. Even, you know, even the five rings, they have protections about that. You cannot use the five rings in your, in your posts. And so all this kind of situation, they try to avoid, and we have to, to tell to the athletes, hey, hey guy, you cannot use the five rings in your posts. You cannot use the Olympic word. You cannot use the Tokyo something. You have to take care of that. So uh, I remember that during the, the Olympic games of Rio, they have like, a, they went come like a more mellow to the athletes, allowing them to make it like some posts on the internet. And they say, okay, you can say uh, thank you to your sponsor, but only say thank you to your sponsor. Don't show the five rings because your sponsor never pay anything to be in the Olympic. Right. The Olympic games are like a very expensive, it's a billion uh, dollars, uh, uh, a business of billion dollars. So we have to take care of uh, about this. And so this is the first thing that we have to take care of and tell to the athletes, hey, we have to avoid this and have to put this in their contracts because they can go to this direction and make some masses in the, the national team and also for their, their, like a, their private career. And when you're talking about the specific for the contracts for the new sports, we have something really, really uh, important to say that's, uh, you know, I will use the skateboarding as a, because it's a sport that I have like a more clothes and I, I can say like a, with more property. Uh, skateboarders cannot compete with the, the brand, any brand of a wheels, or trucks, or boards, or even the, the, the gears, even the safety gears. So when you have the, on a skateboarder, for example, I will use Dora, for example, she has an, her, her own model of board. She's a professional skateboarder and holds on a board with her name. So she designed the board. She made everything to, like, to allow her to compete and, and you know, to performance better. Mm -hmm. So it's not fair that like another brand comes to to daughter and say, okay, now you have to use this kind of board. Uh, probably like a will mask her like a classification, even the podium. So 
for the Olympics, it's allowed to to use the the brand that you have uh, as your like a uh, to compete to perform, and that's something that I have to remember all the the lawyers and everybody that's uh, uh, that's connected to the sports. If you are at, if you have an athlete that's already sponsored by some brand, that's not the same brand that is sponsoring the national team. Mm-hmm. You, your athlete who, who like uh, will be probably facing some kind of problems. Like uh, for example, uh, I use brands like uh, once uh, Natalia already used these names. Okay, uh, if the skateboarder is sponsored by Vans, he cannot be in the competition using a Nike because he always skate wearing Vans. So it's not fair to him. Okay, now you have to use this this Nike shoes and. The same thing happens like a, in the activities out of the competition. Sometimes the national Olympic teams, they have a different sponsors for, for the podiums. They have a different sponsors for the village and even for the trips. And so, for example, I, I always use this, uh, this example. It was something like, a, you know, it's, it was something like a super, uh, super special to the sport. It's like a super remarkable for the, the stories of the sports. It was when Michael Jordan came to the podium in 1992 uh, during the Barcelona Olympic Games and he covered the, the logo from the sponsor of the national team with the U.S. flag. And he only did that because the sponsor of the national team was not the same sponsor of her personal sponsor. So I, I'm not sharing something like uh, something new or so, oh my God, you are saying something like crazy, no. If you watch the, the documentary of Michael Jordan and Netflix, he, he shared this information like a, very clearly because that was something very, very hard to him. How could like a, he could be in a different brand, showing like a different brand if he was making money to another one? So not only to perform, like a, if you have a personal one, okay, during the podium, you have to use the, the National Olympic team uh, sponsor, but to perform, you are allowed to be using where it's better to you. So if your daughter is like competing with the best wheels to her, it's from the brand X. I don't know the, the brand of the, the wheels that she's using or even the trucks. She can be in the Olympics using this kind of uh, uh, gears. But of course, uh, can she put like a, the big name of this brand? No. Then we like uh, face the the rule fifty that we had like a the, the right. nice uh, article that we wrote there. Uh, they have some patterns that you have to follow. For example, the size of the logos, uh, where you can place the logos. For example, I, I'm not sure, but I think that they change from six to ten centimeters to, to square centimeters. Mm-hmm. So it's really a uh, small, but you can use that. But there's something like a really, really important that we have to, to, to tell to, the, to everyone that's like, a, even like a, if the athlete's doing this kind of, a, uh, do, this kind of thing in the, the competition, you're like using the helmet, whatever, this product must be marketed uh, six months before the competition. So that's another like a rule that if you have an athlete, hey guy, uh, you have an, uh, this kind of, uh, for, I will use, a, again, door as an example. Uh, no, better saying, I will use uh, another famous girl. I will use Sky Brown. Sky Brown has a, a helmet that has like a, her model. Sky Brown for, uh, for, a, for a helmet. Of course, that this helmet is only allowed to be used during the Olympics if this helmet is on the market before February 21st. Because if they put like a, this one on the market after that, the National Olympic Committee cannot say to the international, hey, this girl will be using this uh, helmet. So, so of course that uh, she, she must place like a, see this, uh, this products on the market before. And the last thing that I have to say is something like a very Californian and so crazy for us that like, we are from uh, another country. We have another issue that we have to place and have to tell them, maybe put it on the contracts to the athletes. It's about the recreational drugs. Uh, okay, it's really, really allowed to be 
uh, using some recreational drugs, uh, recreation substance, not drugs, substance here in California, uh, much more now in Oregon. But in some countries, these this substances are also a crime. So if you have an athlete that is sponsored by a brand and competing for another country where this uh, substance is still a crime, you have to place this kind of situation on their, on their contracts because it's like a, it's not nice to see someone uh, like a holding uh, something like a, some drugs in the hands or uh, taking some drugs, smoking, drinking. It's not fair. It's not a sport. It's not clear. And that's go like a goes totally against what the Olympics wants to see in the athletes. So I, I will use Dora for example. I, I'm a big fan of her. I follow her in all the media's. I know everything about her. Uh, so you you will see Dora eating like a, the best food. You will see Dora eating like a, and drinking everything good. Uh, you will see Dora going to the gym. You will see Dora drinking the energy drink that sponsored her. She will see that she's a clear, like a, a clean athlete. She's not, like, you never see her like a drinking alcohol or a partying or like a going wild with the people because she's an athlete, she's a professional athlete. That's what you expect for your professional athlete. So that's something that you have to share with the, the athlete that you have in your team. Like, a, okay, you have to put some boundaries in your life and change everything because I don't want to see my, my brand like connected to this kind of behavior. And last thing uh, that I have to, to tell a little bit, something that another client that came to me last week, it's not about a skate, but it's something that very new and I, and I just to take here the note and remember that to share with you too. Um, uh, a client just came to me last week and said, okay, I had to put something in my contract about the pay-per-views because many competitions are now streamed by the internet. Mm -hmm. And they are being paid a lot of money. That so, if the like, for example, if the the company who is holding the competitions making money and they are sharing to the athletes, I need my share too. So that's something that we have to talk about in the future: the pay-per-views and also the streamings. How they are paying to the athletes to be like a sharing their image. I'm telling you that because in Brazil have the protection for the athletes' image. That's different for like a, uh, the right as an athlete. Mm -hmm. So they have different, like one is civil law and the other one's for the labor law, but both protect the, the image from the athletes. And that's something that you have to, to start to talk in the future because the future is like, a, is, is going, we are going fast to the future and probably internet is gonna be the, the future of the, all the streaming and the transmission. Mm -hmm. And I believe that I, I probably go like a, yeah, I'm two minutes, more than I had to be saying that. Thank you. And I'm here if, if you guys have any question, I'm like, I, I would love to, to answer that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So informative. Um, amazing. So let's go to a chat. We already do have a question. Um, so our first question is from Linda. If you signed with a sponsor before you were 18, who signed on your behalf required here, or be an emancipated emancipated minor mm, I'm not sure what the exact question is um Linda if you could clarify a little bit can uh, you repeat a question yeah uh if you signed with a sponsor before you were 18 who signed on your behalf required here or be an emancipated minor um that's what it says. Okay, I, I will try to answer that because uh, okay. she's probably asking something about like a, sometimes, again, I, I, I think that I can use Dora because she's here on the screen and I can't I can talk about her because she just turned like a 19 now. She's, she had some contracts that she signed as a minor before. And right after she turned it like 18, uh, everything changed in the laws. So it, we, like a, you become, when you become an, an adult, you have different uh, like uh, rights and of course the obligations. So once you had an uh, old contract signed by your parents or who has like a, the rights to sign for you, probably you have to like a, make a new one when you turn 18 because you have a new rights, probably like a, 
your parents cannot like put you in a contract for five years when you are like a 15 and now you are 20. Okay, I still stuck it on this kind of a contract because my daddy was like uh, making some money about me. So that's something like a, the law allows to the athletes. I'm telling you because in Brazil, we have this kind of protection. Uh, mm -hmm. If you turn 18, you are allowed to like uh, make this change in your contract, make a new one. And even if you are like a, if you are emancipated, of course, that you don't need to make a new one because you are probably, a, you have the same rights and obligation as a, as an adult. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Daria. She's a legal question for Dora. Are you ready? Okay. Her question is, wow, it's crazy. What is your favorite trick? And what oh, is Oh, that's a great one. one. <laughs> Very legal question. Probably the last one I learned. It's called hill flip indie. It's the hardest one I did, so I think that's the one. Nice. And then, what's like a cool trick for beginners if they want to start learning? The first one you need to learn it's ollie. It's just like popping up the flat. So. It's the first one you need to learn to do everything else. Then you can do flips, shove it. So if you want to learn something, the first one is a nolly. Okay, awesome. Do you think it's hard to start as an adult? What? Do you think it's hard to start as an adult? Like if I wanted to start tomorrow? No, you can start. Yeah. Just use protection and have fun. Everybody <laughs> can do it. <laughs> you like I'd break my legs. <laughs> no, you will not. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Daria, for the question. Thank you. Um, do you have any other questions? Also, if the panelists have questions for any of the other panelists, um, or for Dora, um, feel free to ask. Um, for now, those are the questions that we have from the attendees. Um, if anybody has any more questions, um, feel free to send them now, or you can also uh, email um, the panelists. We're actually almost out of time. So if you would like, uh, definitely email the panelists and they'd be more than happy to answer your questions and they can probably go into way more detail um, than they can here. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for taking time to come and speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you to International Committee, to Gena and Alex for helping with all of the setup and the tech issues and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, Alexander, and Dora. I really appreciate it. Um, I've had a lovely lunch break um, with you guys. Good luck, Dora. Woo! Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations to Dora. Just yeah. say, amazing to <laughs> see like you. a woman. Yeah. yeah. Leading a men's sport. Like, I, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.